All right. Agitators Anonymous episode, who knows? I'm here with Chuck Keller. Hello, Chuck. How are you? Hello. <laughs> Doing fine. Well, that, Trying to thaw out over here, you know. <laughs> yeah, so this is Order from Chaos, Fulpecula, Eris Kingdom. We're going to talk about your own personal interests, which I think will interest people on the podcast. Uh, a little bit of Bathory stuff, this, that, and the other, because you were a close friend of Corthon's. But I suppose let's start at the start, which is Order from Chaos, which must be what, 87, 88? What's the first demo? Uh, yeah, 87. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, I started in 87. Um, the roots of it go back a little bit further. I had fallen into a new group of friends in going on late 86. One of them happened to be Pete. Yeah. Um, and we played in a cover band. We were pretty good. I, I, to me, we were the best band in the city, uh, apart from maybe one other. But all we did was covers. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and by the spring of 87, we're going, hey, this is boring. Let's start doing our own stuff. So Pete and I got to work, started writing music, and we could not interest the other guys. You know, it's, it's a familiar story. Everybody, everybody has a story like this. Um, and eventually that cover band fell apart, summer of 87. And I left, and then Pete mm -hmm. left, and we joined together. and started OFC and uh, you know we didn't have a drummer at first we spent that whole autumn just writing new material um, and I said you know I played with a guy in high school and I had known him since like first grade so uh, you know I, I had some old recordings of Mike and I kicking around playing old Metallica stuff and he's like yeah yeah call him up so we had Mike come over and, and he listened to our ratty ass demo and said yeah I want in so you know, he joined right then and there, and <laughs> it, was, it was just the three of us from beginning to end. Yeah, I mean, the thing that I guess that um, I tape traded the demos, maybe, you know, 89 or 90, but really it was a big package that arrived to me from Sackers, from Rodding Christ, with the Unisound version of Stillbirth Machine. <laughs> yeah. That sort yeah. of, um, which still today is one of my very favorite records of that entire period. I'm going to get into that. But all the images in the fanzines at that time um, really set Order from Chaos really apart from so many other bands. Because for a, a European who was fascinated, obviously, with the European black metal scene, you guys didn't look like the usual American band. And that's what sort of fascinated, uh, in the fullness of time, so many Europeans who were drawn to that imagery. Because you seem to stand out, like, miles from the sort of death metal scene of the time or the Impetigos or all those kind of bands, you know? Yeah, uh, we were stuck in the 80s mm. you know, we basically looked like sodom did yeah. in the mid 80s that's that's who we are that's yeah. who we were we weren't going to pretend that we were something else you know we never ever wore any makeup mm -hmm. that was just that was out of the question from the very beginning um mm -hmm. and we just we just were who we were and we were more focused on the music mm. than than the imagery. I mean, imagery, it's damned important. There's no doubt about it. And if they were in the band, paid no attention to images or to imagery. I mean, apart from what we were doing on the records. Um, and we always like to say, you know, we were we formed because of Venom, we formed because of Sodom, Bathory, yeah. Slayer. Metallica and and what did those apart from Slayer? What did most of those bands look like? They kind of look like mm -hmm. us: bullets, spikes, leather. That's it. Um, and we were never really mm -hmm. embraced or what's the word? My stupid phone's going off. Shut up. Um, we were never really embraced by the extreme death metal crowd uh, yeah. because we didn't grind. You know, we weren't the and we didn't yeah. do any of that shit. You yeah. know, and it was all cool in 88 and 89 when it was new, but after a while, it just became this ridiculous crutch that everybody's expected to do, to do that. Fast forward to today, that's what most bands do is, you know, uh, you know. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it, it always struck me that you guys, um, or at least seemed more aligned with many of the South American or European bands that I was drawn to the same sort of imagery. And it, like I said, it seemed very at odds uh, with the American scene but who were the uh, other bands in your area? Like you guys were sort of stuck on your own a bit, right? None. None. There was really no, there was no other bands. Oh, well, there was one. There was a band called Vevictus. 
And I think they finally have their own uh, metal archives page. But for years, there was nothing about them. And they were a local, basically a demo band. They never did anything but two demos. And they were just the typical jeans and t-shirts kind of guys, but they, they had a lot in common with us. Creator, Sodom, you know, Slayer were their primary influences, Voivod, you know, yeah, yeah. and so our bands were really tight, um, but it was the end of their life. They caught a disease that I commonly call Soundgarden, where <laughs> they heard that shitty band and decided that's what we want to do, yeah, okay. and so they ran off and, and alienated one from themselves from one another. Um, <laughs> and I want to do this, I want to do that, but ultimately the guys that were really making the decisions mm -hmm. wanted to do. Yeah, in Ireland it was called the Prodigy. Do the Soundgarden thing, and so the whole band just fell apart. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, I get it. I get it. In, in Ireland. Um, so it, for, it, to this day, I have. Yeah, to this day, I have an absolute hatred of Soundgarden because I blame them for breaking up Invictus, which is the only other great band <laughs> I'm from Kansas City. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. But like, I remember getting that package from Sackers and putting on Stillbirth Machine. And to this day, I was playing it to the guys from Malthusian. Um, slightly younger generation than me guys here uh, we're talking about stillbirth machine and i was you know wildly gesticulating about it and um you know that they had to you have to hear this fucking record but it still struck me almost 30 years later the caustic uh, nature of the tone was just still so striking now it's uh, the same thing happened to me almost 30 years later like how where the fuck did that come from because it still is um, one of my favorite sounds of any kind of, of any record of that period. Well, I'll tread carefully because I, I think it's pretty well known. I hate that album. I love the songs. I hate the sound of that album. Really? Um, well, I hate the guitar tone. I think the drums sound great. Bass sounds great. Vocals sound great. Guitars are shit. Mm. Um, and it was, I overthought it and it, I take on all the blame myself. Uh, we, we had a producer that we had worked with since uh, Crushed Infamy, yeah, um, sure. which came out great. It's, that's still one of my favorite recordings. Yeah, yeah. But we could never recapture those that set of balls. And we didn't until basically an ending in fire. Right. But yeah. um, Silverth Machine was our last recording project with that old producer. Um, and At, the, at that point, he had kind of backed away and just let me have my way. And sure. because I was closer to him and also where we were recording, I was kind of driving the recording process. And I recorded the guitars. Uh, and, and you know how it is. You, you make a recording, you get a cassette of it back in those days. You take it home, you start playing it on your stereos yeah, yeah. to decide whether or not you like it. And I'm like, this is all crap. This is just, I was so frustrated. And, and Ron finally said, well, let's just re-record the guitars. Okay, yeah, let's do that. And to this day, I, I thought I used my old Marshall MOSFET to record both sessions. I may not have, I just don't remember. I've asked Mike, I'm like, do you remember? And no, I have no idea. Well, it, we spent, wasted months re-recording it. Maybe from your perspective, you're gonna go, I'm glad you did because it came out really well, this is what I like. But that was not at all the vision I had for Stillbirth Machine. So maybe it's better I didn't get my way, but um, well, I, I still, I think maybe what it, that is the difference between a singer and a guitar player then, but I, I'm, I still like, for me, 30 years on from when I got it, it still does the same thing to me when I hear that record. And I, I'm struck by the attack. That may not be the attack, the tone of the attack that you might've intended, but back then in 91, it, it set you guys out so differently from all of the other things that were happening. Like it was, um, it was almost like, well, of course it was cult as we, you know, we people came to use it with the capital <laughs> yeah. K. Right. But right. It, was, it was sort of like spoken about in hushed terms. I remember saying to Dara from Invictus, listen, you know, have you heard this fucking Order from Chaos record it, maybe a year or two later? And, oh, you know, it was hushed tones. I'm not, not sure you'll like it kind of thing, you know. And I suppose it's kind of spread amongst all the kind of people who you kind of thought, well, maybe you should hear this or maybe you shouldn't. But I don't know. We may, that's interesting you say that because um, I, I'm sure if you said to Kieran from Primordial, Somebody said, oh, I love the tone on the first album in Rama from 93. He'd be like, oh, because <laughs> it reminds yeah, me of playing through some exactly. tiny little combo, exactly. Or something, you know? Exactly. To, to guys that, you know, that the tone is everything or the guys that were directly involved in the production, if it isn't right for them, they're all, they're all, we're always going to go, 
Oh, I don't know, man. It's yeah, just, yeah. I'm glad you like it. I mean, I, I guess I wouldn't change a thing in retrospect, but yeah. ultimately, uh, you know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I've, I've kind of never had the attitude of being, I've never been a, a total uh, purist about the sound or uh, of any of the records that I've made in the sense that if it feels kind of right, I let it go. I'm not, uh, I don't tweak and tweak and tweak. I'm not a perfectionist. Well, as, as a fan, I do this. As the fan, I don't make those, I don't make those kind of demands on a record. I will yeah. accept whatever's handed to me and see if I like it in its context. Do yeah. I need to, do I need to look in a little deeper? I mean, cause there are some albums that have absolutely terrible production yeah. that we all adore. You know, yeah. I mean, there's, I have the same way. You look at the old Rotting Christ stuff. Some of that yeah. stuff is just like, you wanted it to sound like that. But as a fan, I'm like, I can't envision this sounding any other way. Well, so, for me, yeah, I guess for me, it was maybe the similar thing was when I first heard maybe War and Pain or something. Um, yeah. Trying to get yeah. my head around that compared to what, you know, you're listening to other thrash bands. And it was a real, you know, that or Bathory was a real, there were real room splitters. You could see Possessed could appeal to thrash metal fans. But Voivod, War and Pain, like I remember playing that to people back then. They were just, what? Just no. <laughs> and oddly enough, it was Dead Kennedy's fans and Minor Threat fans sometimes who seemed to sort of like it more because the, the kind of the crudeness of venom had been sort of forgotten by 88 89 everybody wanted i suppose practice what you preach in nuclear assault and all that kind of thing but after stilbert machine you have what then do you have the plateau of invincibility and and i saw eternity eps right through the uh, dawnbringer it was a plateau which was supposed to be the the great reset in terms <laughs> of production we got sure. you know o ofc only ever really worked in one truly professional studio and it was for stilbert machine yeah. But it wasn't a functioning studio at that point. I don't know if you remember the uh, the old American American band Shooting Star. No, but no, okay. Well, there's a they they had some mild success somewhere, some places in Europe. They're known anyway. Uh, the owner of that studio was the brother of Ron, the producer, and right. by that time, Shooting Star was pretty much dead. Right, right, uh, right. Everybody was away raising families. No upkeep had been done on the studio, so we're in there recording. Um, and that was a professional studio. All we had to really do was come up with uh, the money for the two-inch tape. Yeah. It's pretty simple for us. Uh, Ron worked free of charge. I mean, he just he'd get he would get shit hammered every session. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and he we'd get about three good hours out of him. And after that, we're like, okay, it's time to go home. <laughs> you know, so uh, that's why it took months to pull Silverth Machine together. Well, after that, we we transitioned to another private studio that was actually a downgrade. It was an eight track cassette studio. Okay. But it was cheap. Yeah. And you know, I'd been conversing with Korth on how do you record, and you know, he was a master of what seems obvious now about bouncing down to different yeah, yeah. tracks. Yeah. Bouncing down. Um, that was new to people like us, and he's like, do that. And I'm like, oh, that's a great idea. So we can turn an eight track cassette studio into basically 12, 14, 16 tracks. Yeah. Um, so that's what we did uh, all the way through the end of an ending in fire and then into Volpecula, both Volpecula sessions were re recorded at the same studio. Yeah, yeah. The Volpecula first was the first is Fonzo Mortalis, right? That has a really, right. really interesting sort of spacey sound, I suppose, right. which was a bit different in the, the playing technique from Mortar from Chaos though, right? Yeah, on purpose. I mean, after OFC was such an all-consuming thing for us that when it finally stopped, it was time for us to go. <sighs> and I had been thinking about doing this quasi space metal ambient project yeah. since as far back as 92 or 93. Yeah. And when OFC ended, I'm like, that's it. That's, that's, this is what I'm going to do. And I tapped the uh, Nepenthe drummer and he was a phenomenal keyboard player um, to do it with me. And of course, his parents owned the studios. So that also helped. Um, so we pulled the, the Volpecula stuff together. We started with a demo that got pressed on seven inch called uh, Phoenix of the Creation. Mm. Um, and then we did Fonzo Mortalis. And then we recorded four or five tracks in 98 that ultimately became what Dara yeah, released yeah. for us as In Dusk Apparition. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, one of the, I think one of the, you probably partly to blame for, I suppose, everyone knowing about Order From Chaos, but just to go back a few years though, is Wild Rags Records, of course. <laughs> yeah. The yeah. endless Wild Rags, like they would just arrive yeah. in your mailbox, 20 copies of the, you know, uh, of the mail order, yeah. and then you'd be trying to charge for them. But we were always fascinated by the Milwaukee Metal Fest lineups. But Order From Chaos didn't really do 
many you you didn't tour America back then though you just would play mm -hmm. singular shows and that kind of thing right because OFC was never popular enough to pull yeah. in we didn't have that kind of appeal yeah like I said at that time everybody wanted the grindy death metal we didn't do that we still played like Voivod yeah, yeah. so we weren't we weren't the band du jour yeah we never were that yeah. um so we never got the same kind of opportunities and you know you look back on it you, you all things being equal you're like maybe that that's definitely the way it should have been but at the time it was hugely frustrating because we're like yeah. we're we're a decent band you know we should yeah. we should have more opportunities than that yeah. you know and our fan base was absolutely rabid yeah, people yeah. The, the the 10 people that liked us really liked us yeah. um so yeah. Yeah, for us, there was a huge disconnect. It didn't make any sense to us, and it was hugely frustrating. So we're pouring our heart and souls into everything that was ordered from chaos. And so in 95, when it finally ended, a predestination, uh, it was just like, oh, okay. Yeah. So I went off and did Bullpecula. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because if you think about it, like, you know, at the time, you have the first Black Metal tours, Running Cry for Blasphemy were on the Fuck Christ tour. And it always struck me as odd that you guys didn't seem to have the same name as, let's say, a blasphemy or um, or where it didn't get opportunities. I know it was difficult for in the early 90s for bands to come across from the US who weren't, you know, even Evelyn Creation style death metal to come across and tour Europe. But there were still moments and there were still things happening and still small shows. It always struck me as, yeah, like you said, odd that it seemed like all of your fans were spread out across Europe and South America and stuff. Right. And the that, same thing happens with Aries Kingdom. Yeah. You know, people that that are unfamiliar with us, they just think, well, there's there's not a lot here on the surface. There's no pose here. There's nothing identifiable. So they can't be that big of a deal. And they see us play or they hear us play and they're like, oh my God, the old yeah. Max L man in the chair like this, you know. Yeah, like, yeah. So I, we're kind of a, a we, we call ourselves ambushers where, you know, you put us on a bill with somebody, we're going to ambush the living shit out of them. Yeah, yeah. We're not going to know yeah. what hit them. Yeah, I know. And it's, it's just the way we do. Yeah, yeah. So maybe if you could think about like uh, the like the in Ireland we have a thing where I think that most of the bands like you know we started Primordial in '91, but it was still kind of gloomy and doomy, and most of the other bands that started around the same time. We had this sort of sodden, earthy, gloomy, sort of miserable air, tragic, semi-tragic air. But there was never the sort of southern equator fire in in in, in many of the bands' of the music. <laughs> And, uh, you know, American bands from different, you know, the tri-state area, the Florida area, the, you know, the West Coast kind of sounds of the different ones. But you guys had, didn't seem to, in all of the things that you've done, to me, it doesn't sound like it's specifically regional to some area in America. Does that make any sense? Okay, should be back. Yeah, yeah. You hear me? Yeah, yeah. You froze there for like two. Okay, seconds. back. All right. You see what you yeah. you know what I mean? Maybe I'm trying to get at is that all the things you've done to me don't sound particularly American. Could that be too? Is that too simplistic? Well, you? and you know, and yours, no, not at all. Because we never wanted to sound like the typical American band. We didn't yeah. want to be uh, malevolent creation. We didn't want to be testament. We didn't want to be any of these bands that were archetypally American. Sure. We had more of a European view. You know, the, the people that we cut our teeth on that inspired us to pick up instruments, mostly the European bands. I mean, yeah, there's Slayer. Yeah, come on, of course. Yeah. But beyond that, it was the European band. So that's how that that was our that was our frame of reference entirely. So yeah. um, it makes sense that you would look at us and go, they don't look American at all. And it, it add to that the fact that we were so isolated uh, in. The Kansas City area that it makes sense that we would sound like no one else and Yosuke that runs NWN his theory is he loves bands that are from the middle of nowhere yeah the one thing that he's noticed connecting dots is like if a band is their own scene they tend to be really unique and usually it's what he likes but there's a lot of truth in what he says I mean the, you go up to Chicago you go to New York you go to Florida and yeah. everybody's the bloody same it's just you can tell they're from a certain area and we just luck of the draw i don't know in missouri it was frustrating because we never got any opportunities um and we were always kind of looked over looked past um but uh looking back on it you know i guess it really shouldn't have been any other way 
Mm. And what was your first, let's say, what was your first show then you played with any of the bands that you've done in Europe? Can you remember that? And uh, the first show, the first real show we you did. You must have been hassled by Old Order from Chaos fans every. every oh, you oh you don't you don't mean what was the first OFC show? No, no, no. Just like because OFC didn't come to Europe till the you know the nuclear oh, war thing. Yeah. So, so you first you first came to Europe then to play oh, with Eris Kingdom, um, right? Yeah, in in oh nine. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean it was. Of course, there are lots of questions about OFT. Yeah, and at that time it was. Are you going to reform? Are you going to do that? Yeah. Sure. Well, sure enough, we did. Like a year after our first AK's first show in Europe, yeah, we did do those those five OFC shows that ended at NWN. Um, but yeah, I mean, the OFC's just always there. We, when we did that tour a few years ago in Europe, you know, the OFC shirts everywhere. Mm. You know, so you just it's it's part of the deal, man. You just go with it. <laughs> it may not be what you're doing now, but it's part of the deal. Yeah, it was very unusual for me to see, like I said, in 91, 92, um, just trying to get one of your shirts was almost impossible. Um, I managed to get the odd one here and there, but no one, again, no one would have known. And then by somewhere in the late 2000s, mid 2000s, or no, let's say 2001, 2002 was when the kind of uh, Beherit blasphemy thing came through. Uh, the sort of transom or whatever you want to call it of the black death yeah. metal scene that sort of third generation and everybody was like you know kind of Beherit Blasphemy yeah. and OFC was coming in kind of right just 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 behind that and it was really strange to witness all of these you know 18 to 22 year old kids listening to the you know the, the three or four bands that in 1991 um, were you know there was only a handful of people that liked but I suppose mm -hmm. that's kind of it that sometimes the impact of a band is only really felt through reverberations down through maybe a decade or two sometimes, you know? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it, OFC got staple gunned onto that wave of, of Behera blasphemy. Yeah. yeah. Um, and yeah. and, and sorry, even sarcophago. Yeah. yeah and sure. it kind of boggles my mind because we don't really have anything in common with those bands. So yeah. it's really odd to me. I think it was just, it was part of that time. Um, but beyond that, I'm like, and I'm I'm not I'm not poo pooing it. I think it's great that we got tacked on somewhere, at least in, yeah, yeah. in our own in our own time frame. But it's just weird that OFC of all bands gets tacked on to those kind of you know bands. I, I, in in my in, in my head at the time, like if you looked at the cassette, like I said my tape trading cassettes, you would have seen like OFC, Mister Fire, Masters Hammer. Uh, you know, Pro Fanatica, maybe something like that from the states, or yeah. but they would have been coupled together, Rotting Christ. Um, those kind of bands on the kind of cassette where you're tape training and going, okay, this person isn't going to like, gonna like do, 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 you know, fucking death, chunky death metal stuff. So yeah, for me, in my head, it makes sense that Sarcophago would be with Order from Chaos. That, I would okay, that. I, that's good. I'm good with that. <laughs> I, I, I would file that, in my, that would be filed in my own gray matter. Those would be on the same shelf, you know, somehow, yeah. if, you know, to compare, uh, file those things. But then the whole, um, I felt the same slow burn with Eris Kingdom then in the sense that I remember getting the first one, and by the time we come around to the third album, I think, is it, um, things, it's just some, some amount in building, people are talking Unbearable about the band and stuff, yeah. Yeah, and it, it, and Slow Burn is exactly the right way to describe it. Um, we're just kind of a grower band, you know, we don't yeah. have that immediate, you know, that makes everybody, it's not, we're not defleshed, yeah, yeah. you know, and so wow, yeah. there is that, and when you sit down and, and you look at the, you deconstruct the songs and read the lyrics, you begin to see there's a lot there. And you're damn right there's a lot there. I pour everything into the lyrics and the concepts. So, um, you know, it's not just crucify Jesus and, and mm. nuns raped. I mean, none of that. I, you write about what you know, and I don't know anything about any of that stuff. So I stick with what I do know, and I pour everything into it. And so when I find, especially with uh, the last album, By the Light of Their Destruction, I mean, seeing people going, wait a minute, these lyrics are something special. Yeah, yeah. That yeah. makes me happy. Yeah, yeah. No, I can. Because, I, and I think all of the lyrics have been special so far, but you know. <laughs> oh, no, I can totally see that. I can totally understand that. So in a sense, we could say but um, throughout the, your musical career, then you've sort of, uh, you've kind of managed to hold on to a certain sort of outsider status in terms of um, the sort of trends or whatever you want to call it through the decades. Is that something that you think about, think about or that you are comfortable with that idea 
that it's it's better to be recognized from the you know the kind of peers who understand it than as you said be i often think about this that some bands get really popular for an album or two and then never they're always chasing their tail constantly for the decades yeah. that popularity goes down you know sorry that yeah, was a and, convoluted question but you know no but, the, but it's true and it's just something that i've grown to accept i mean for a while it was a huge frustration I'm like why the hell am i doing this yeah you know i know that the quality of what we're doing is so much better than practically everything else out there why the hell am i doing this if nobody cares mm. um but ultimately as an artist you're like well i care it's but, what i do like i said the slow burn and residual slow effect burn yeah and to, that's trying to take effect in the last decade i could see that for sure and and that's what's really kind of softened the the disappointment that we that was felt years ago mm. um you know the, the fact that things have finally come around and you know there is some recognition there yeah, and I, I mean, like I said, even anecdotally, in my own experience of like, say, being an Order from Chaos fan for throughout all the decades, that my vicarious thrill of playing some of the records to people who are generations, bit, you know, younger than me and the scene and go, what the fuck kind of thing. <laughs> um, to yeah. me, that in some way, you know, we're going to say that's worth quite a lot fundamentally than going, oh, did you hear the debut album by such and such? Yeah, I heard it was good. Do you care? No, not really. The fact right. that somebody still feels so like I would always I'd always stand up to bat for like, you know, Satanist Tedium, Passage to Arturo. Um, oh, yeah. You know, first in Pell Nazarin EPs. Oh, I, yeah. I, I that kind of stuff, and I'd always go into bat, you know, people would be like, oh, what are you what are you doing with the rotting Christ? I mean, blah, you know, the way they sounded, you know, with some of the albums, the middle albums. So I love the new albums, but the middle albums and I go, listen, have you heard Satanist Tedium? Shut the fuck up and listen to yeah, right. the Hill of right. Christian or something. And generally the reaction is, what the fuck, you know? And I still get, yeah. still get that reaction now from Order from Chaos. I think has got to be um, has got to be quite rewarding somehow. Well, yeah. I mean, just to hear it from you, it is incredibly rewarding. It, it really makes me feel good. <laughs> like I haven't I truly. None of us have wasted our time doing this, so I mean, no, it's no. just really a great thing to hear, and it's certainly something that is uh, uh, gratifying. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, you know, like I said, it's just bizarre that through all the years we, we managed to miss each other, uh, whereas I might be standing in room A when you were in room yeah. A at the same festival, but sure, yeah. that's yeah. how it goes sometimes, but here we are. Well, I think back in those days, we didn't know how much we both loved Holy Terror, so ah. that, was, that may, <laughs> yeah. may have been part of it, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's, honestly, Mind Wars is my favorite heavy metal record pro ever made, I think. Oh, that's fantastic. To, I had yeah. to do a podcast just about it, and I managed to ramble for like 30, 35 minutes just off the top of my head just about it. Because it was my uncle gave me that record, um, it, I think it was like November 1988. He used to work in a second-hand record store on the Saturdays. Sometimes he would just like take two or three records and just give them to me. And it would always be like, oh, yeah, here's the new Every Mother's Nightmare or something. I'm like, oh, okay. But he, he, hit, he, hit, he hit a home run. Uh, one day when he gave me Mind Wars and I think Dark Angel, I think the live album live, no, I can't remember, but it was Dark Angel and Holy Terror and that was somewhere at the end of 88. But yeah, Holy Terror was again a band that sound, or so it sounds like such an anomaly for the American trash scene. It's a really strange band. Yeah, 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 it, it really was. And I remember that I worked in a record store from 1986 to about 19, late 1990. I mean, during, you know, Golden years of thrash all the way through early death metal and Holy Terror being on Under One Flag, obviously that's an import here in the States. Yeah, yeah. And it was amazing. I loved Under One Flag releases because they put so, they seem to put so much into them. The quality yeah. was so much better in the vinyl and, and the print and, and the time that they see, the band seemed to take with their record. So when a, a new Sacrilege came out or, or, you know, the first Holy Terror album came out and I'm like, what is this? This yeah, is... Yeah. It, kind of, it was just, it, it pushed you on the back foot because it didn't sound like what the record looked like, but it also wasn't inappropriate. And yeah. so it was challenging in a, in a long-term sense. It's something that took you some time to wrap your head around. And then, like you say, by the time Mind Wars came out, you're like, yeah, it's where they really hit their stride. And it's one of those weird points where, one of those or weird moments where you can, where you look at it, you point to a band's career to the uninitiated and it's one of those weird moments you can say the second album is better than the first. Yeah, yeah. Normally it's, it's the other way around, right? Yeah. But, you know, yeah, I'm like, yeah, mind wars, I'm with you. Yeah, and I remember talking to, uh, <laughs> I remember talking to Mille from Creator and he, um, he told me about touring with them for Mind Wars and how the band practically self-destructed on, uh, 
on tour with him and his story about what they were like and also the level of their musicianship but just kind of being off the dial off the dial but as people he could see they were like oh here's a band who are not long for the not long for this world you know right and oddly but, enough, and, uh, our, our, uh, our other guitarist that's not playing with us currently he saw holy terror in 88 yeah. I was away on a family holiday and he got to see them. I think they were on tour with uh, DRI. Yeah. And I'm super jealous of him for having seen them. Yeah. But he said it was, it was, it would have been the end of that 88 tour where everything really was falling apart. Yeah. And he said, they clearly did not give a shit. Yeah. He said Keith Dean got up there and I think it was pink sweats and he had yeah. a beer and a cigarette and he's smoking, doing the vocals and, you know, Kurt's killing it obviously, yeah. but he's like, it was fantastic. But he gives, you could tell that they were just not, yeah. They were going through the motions. I'm like, yeah, but you still saw them. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. They were, they were, they were announced to play here. I think as a support to Exodus and Nuclear Assault, and the tour got cancelled. And then they played in the UK with I think Napalm Death and DRI, and then the Creator tour in Europe. And I think that's about. I think after that they just combusted. But oddly enough, I, right. I oddly enough, I was in touch with Kurt Kilfelt through email about. It must be nearly 20 years ago, I tracked his email down um, from some old website and I wanted to send him Primordial City to so just send him everything. And I, I, from what I remember, my memory says to me now, it's probably somebody's going to come on in the comments and go, that's not the way it was at all. But um, the bass player of High on Fire, Jeff, um, really good, good guy, he played in a ill-fated Holy Terror reunion for one show where he played the bass. And I think they played in 2001 opening for an Iron Maiden covers band with a Paul Diano singer, just like oh 25, 30 people, not really, not really Reformation, but just like they right. all come up and played um, Floyd and, uh, you know, um, what was the other guitar player's name? Um, uh, oh, I can't remember. He probably kicked my ass. Curtin in the and um, uh, Mike Alford. Mike Alford. Oh, yeah. And I heard that there was some kind of, they played a few songs to about Alvold. 25 people. Back. Mike Alvold. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. yeah. And it was unusual when I sent him all the primordial stuff. He's like, oh, but people still give a shit about the band. Yeah, 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 they do. And he was like, oh, I was thinking of making a new demo. And I was thinking to myself, he's, not, he's surely not going to ask me to sing. Surely not. So I was sitting there going, would you sing for Holy Terror if you were asked? And then I came to the conclusion that, no, you shouldn't. Don't ruin your favorite band. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, I understand. I get it. <laughs> Although, it would have been cool just to be asked, though, you know. Yeah, I know, I'm not sure if the ask, asking was forthcoming, but in my head, I thought that was going to be the next question. Mm -hmm. But we did we did do right. a recording of a bit of a recording of Distant Calling a few albums ago with, with a Primordial. But we just never put the solos and stuff to it and never finished it. I must try and find it somewhere and uh, finish it. Yeah, but, finish it up. <laughs> but I wanted to ask, uh, ask you there, like pivot a tiny bit, because you talked about the lyrics of Eris Kingdom. And I suppose this would be a good segue into um your own personal interests that have sort of influenced the lyrics you were saying astronomy cosmology and your well you you what you wrote to me was your appraisal of historic artifacts that sounds kind of fascinating in itself what exactly does that entail well i i'm a degreed historian that doesn't want to teach all right <laughs> um and so you know what else are you going to do yeah. so i i started out working for auction houses in the 90s as a researcher and writer and worked with a lot of military history. Uh, and then I segued into fine art, higher end antiques, rare antiquarian books, things like that. And obviously, you know, historical stuff. So um, that's what I do uh, yeah. for a living. That's the only way you can't make money doing music, obviously, <laughs> you know, yeah, um, I know. but it's, it's, it's the, it's what I'm around all the time and it's deeply inspiring. You know, the historical side of it, um, it gives you a perspective, it demystifies history, what I do. So uh, really? there's a lot of people that, that approach, they approach the past, they'll watch a documentary, they'll read a book, and but they don't really know what the things look like, felt like, smelled like, taste like. You know, those are things that I do have experience with and have informed you know, how I approach what I do. Um, so... Can I quantify all that? No, it's just, I can tell you for a fact that's, that's the, the frame of reference for when I write, um, that all these things are in the back of my mind. If there's a, a specific lyric, there, there may actually be a real life component that inspired 
those two or three lines um, that come from my own experience. And then again, there may not be. I don't know. <laughs> it's, you know, it's a case by case thing. And what do you mean? Like, what do you mean? Uh, explain to mystify history in that sense, and that you're kind of um, you're not prone to the romantic vision of certain elements of the past because you know the kind of the backstory. The yeah, end. not at all. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and just when you come to realize that people are people and human nature hasn't really changed that much, yeah. the clothes have changed, the accoutrements have changed, but when it comes right down to it, not all that much has changed with us. Um, and so when you're reading about something that happened in the past, it's not really possible to explain, say, let's say the 1918 flu pandemic. Yeah. Until a year ago, the only people talking about it were historians like me yeah. and academics and maybe the occasional uh, virologist. Uh, but now it's, it's everywhere. And yeah. it's, it, it's the kind of thing people that they'll look back on the past and they'll go, well, it had to be a lot different. In actuality, no, really, it wasn't that much different. I mean, the, the only things that are different now is that it's a little, it's more politicized. Yeah, than it was back then, but it was still politicized back then too. Yeah. Um, and in terms of demystification, when you look at something from, you know, whether it's 20th century or 19th century or 18th century, when you walk into a museum, you can see that item on a display case, but you'll have a really hard time connecting it with its, with its actual past. And when it comes, like when you think about antiquities, one of the biggest problems and, and, and worst crimes about antiquity trafficking, trafficking is when an artifact is taken from its original context, it's yeah. almost impossible to put it back. So if you take a little statuette from an alcove in a Mesoamerican temple and, you know, and, and sell it somewhere else, once you remove it from that, that little place, you've, you've destroyed some aspect of the greater human story. And um, it's a very, it is a high crime to me, yeah. um, but I'm one of those people that is an historian and the, and the things that I've worked with, um, I'm not watching the History Channel and wondering what does that look like or not, you're just seeing something on the screen but not really identifying what it is. I'm one of those people that's been lucky enough to have held it, uh, worn it, you know, tasted it. I mean, sure, yeah. <laughs> I mean it's, sure, yeah. it's, it's, it's 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 difficult because I you know I've been doing this twenty almost twenty five years and so I've seen a lot of stuff, yeah, and a and a wide variety of things so it's it's a little tough for me to just kind of encapsulate in a podcast but oh no yeah yeah um, no it's just it's like, probably clear as mud right you know no no I, 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 it's because it's a it's a it's a an idea that I've often thought about um you know in as much as that I've always been very interested in history and wrote written about that with primordial or written papers on this that and the other thing. But the idea that uh, every generation somehow thinks that it's particularly um, unusual in its experience of the, the living through that moment, when in actuality, mm -hmm. um, there are just all these pointers that you can easily explain the human behavior within that moment through our understanding of the past. And we aren't that exceptional, all things considered. But yet at the moment, it just seems like particularly hysterical our reaction to the moment. We seem to believe that we're the first people ever to have dealt with any of these things. And, you know, and you, then you try to say to, even just casually say to people like, well, you know, impeachment has happened before. And, you know, whether it was Clinton or Nixon or like, the, not everything is completely unusual to your moment, if I were you interpret it. But I think it speaks to um, the narcissistic age that we live in, that everybody somehow is playing themselves as the main role in their own movie, so to speak, and that, that history bends around them when in actually, actuality, it's completely the opposite. It's kind of right. We, we, have a, we have a similar hubris to the Victorians in the sense that we, we have this weird belief that we're the, we're the pinnacle of evolution. Yeah. When there really is no, there is no pinnacle in evolution, none, you know, but we're, it's like you say, we're a moment in time, we're a snapshot, this is where we are right now. But yeah, there are a lot of people, and there always have been a lot of people that their perspective is entirely a bubble it's yeah. just whatever's around them and i hear it a lot when i draw an historical parallel to something that's going on if people don't agree with what i'm saying because it may seem to undermine their political position the yeah. first thing i hear is well that was then this is now and it's different 
And I'm like, yeah, well, look, history doesn't repeat itself, but it certainly does like certain themes. Yeah. And it loves to replay those themes. Yeah. And there are certain similarities yeah. that under that, that, that an undercurrent in all of those things that, that you need to pay attention to. Yeah. And I, I think that entirely speaks to our relationship to, for example, let's let's say um, roughly speaking, in terms of some of the things that are happening in lockdown, i.e., the expedition of some form of we could observe technocratic surveillance state and you say to people well this mm -hmm. this has elements of um you know the soviet state this has elements of stasi this and that and the other and somehow we seem to think like oh like especially in Ireland, we go oh, that can't really happen here and you go well soft authoritarianism um let's put it this way democracy isn't the default setting of society and trying to put that across to people now like hey you need to be aware but of course Again, everybody has this narcissistic, selfish belief that, 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 that thinks they're, that that kind of thing, they can't learn anything from that. I don't know what I'm trying, what the question is, but you know what I'm trying to get at, maybe, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I know lockdown in Europe is a lot more <laughs> tight yeah. than in the U.S. And, you know, in the U.S., it's paid a, it, we, pay, it, we paid a steep price over here. I, I had COVID last month. Oh, yeah? And um, yeah, I had it for uh, two weeks. Um, it's not fun. Yeah. Um, you know, and the, the U.S. did an absolutely abysmal job addressing it. And a lot of that is the political side of it. Um, I'm not going to get into at this point. Sure, but yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? It's it was the politics that still informs a lot of people's beliefs about just exactly what the virus is. Mm. Um, you know, people that want to believe it came from somewhere in a lab. I'm like, no, but anyway, <laughs> yeah. reasoning with those people is, it's almost a clockwork orange kind of thing where I don't really care to reason with you. It's just got to be a certain way right now so we can get through this. Yeah, this is like you said, democracy is not a default setting. And what we're going through right now is in a default setting. It's not going to become a default setting. At least, you know, in this country, um, I can't speak to over there. You guys have to sort that out yourselves. Yeah. Um, wow. The U.S., I think the U.S. is probably done trying to export democracy. I think we've finally learned that if you want it, you got to get it yourself, kid. Mm. Um, at least I hope we've learned that. Um, yeah, I don't know where I was going with all that. No, no, no. I'm just, no, I find it interesting. And just the, the idea that I, what I'm trying to be, sort of, I suppose, pivot between is the um, the belief, the sort of narcissistic belief that modern society has to not learn from the past, but yet also try and believe that it's still this, you know, acting the centerpiece in the movie of its own life, so to speak. And also the kind of lack of maybe let's call it emotional understanding or political or historical understanding to at least when I, you know, trying to move into saying to people like, hey, you should recognize the signposts on the, on the way to the, you know, the, the soft trajectory of authoritarianism because they're everywhere. And then the idea that we have nothing to learn from the signposts of history that lead people into the same penury state is, um, yeah, it's so, to me, so naive and so um, such a misreading of history that I, I sometimes can't quite fathom our inability to, 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 to learn from that. I don't know if that's a question or a statement or, <laughs> or whatever. Well, you know. and, and I know what you're saying, and, and it's a difficult thing indeed, because we can point to certain periods in history or specific events, and they may or may not apply to what's going on right now. Mm -hmm. um, and again, that's where I get a lot of pushback. If I'll point to something, you know, the, the, the big thing right now is, oh, we're, we're, in the, we're in a new Weimar period. And I'm like, really? Yeah. Okay. And I have this conversation again, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, and as an historian, it's, it's, it's something that you attempt to deconstruct for people and yeah. maybe not, if you're not trying to deconstruct it, you're, you're trying to put it in perspective. And again, it's the, the perspective that you're talking about where your belief that it's going in this one direction may not be true. It mm. may be true. I don't yeah. know, but is that the, is that going to be the end? There's, no end to all this. This is the other thing that scared, that that I think is uh, underpins a lot of the fear in our societies and cultures is that if it goes this way, it's going to be that way forever. Like history yeah. shows the the one overarching theme is that it doesn't stay the same, and yeah. that there are 
massive changes. And I'm one of those guys that, you know, I look back on, you know, on the past and the guys in the band will tell you this for the last five, seven, eight years, I've been asking, is there going to be some world convulsion similar to what happened in the early 19th century within the first 20 years of the 19th century being Napoleon um, and in the 20th century being the first world war, is there going to be something that sets the tone for the entire century or are, or is society going to gently evolve, be allowed to gently evolve without some big cataclysmic event? Yeah. And now I have my answer. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but I've been asking, is, is there going to be something now? Is that a hard and fast rule? Is the 22nd century going to have something like that? Not necessarily. Yeah. But, you know, my 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 opposite number in 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 uh, in twenty one fifteen is going to be asking the same question. Is there going to be something that happens here in yeah. the next five or 10 years? that's going to set the tone for the century. Yeah, I like I said, I mean, it's, you know, maybe I should know better, but somehow it feels like this is a part of it. Or, you know, when they talked about the fourth industrial revolution, or all that kind of thing, um, you do feel that as boring as it, as it is to be this last year is somehow um, there is a recalibration of certain elements that I feel may be happening and that this may be uh, one of those pivotal moments in history. But again, maybe that's my own algorithm feeding me my own, um, you know, crazy outrage because I'm in essentially isolation for the last year. So mm -hmm. I've been trying to hold the line between what is my own um, perception, which is just, a, you know, mm -hmm. on a screen, which is inspired by my own uh, I suppose, sense of outrage or, uh, or many other things and what is actually happening. So the idea of what's malign, what's benign, what's malice, what's incompetence, what's this, I did, or, it's very hard to judge because at the end of the day, it can still just be a botched response by a broken system run by cowards. And that can explain a lot of it, or it can explain very, very little of it. And it's probably going to explain a lot of it, man. Come yeah. on. <laughs> yeah, but, but that's, that's what I see. That's what I hope. I hope it does. And that the, the malign Machiavellian, let's say, you know, authoritarian, authoritarian surveillance state I, section of it is being pushed to the periphery by, as I said, the, the botched system, blah, 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 blah. But again, it's very hard to know because at the end of the day, we all, especially here, you sit at the end of the screen and you take in your information and you try and judge that based on your own um, previous life experience because you were able to assess more of the world than you are now because you can't really do anything so it's, it's breaks it's uh, brain break yeah it, it really is and yeah it's it's kind of funny when i had covid and i was down for two weeks i mean one of the worst things you can do to me is give me a lot of time to think <laughs> <And> yeah. <laughs> so I, I can go down some really dark rabbit holes and i did i really went down some dark rabbit holes yeah and yeah. it wasn't until i was able to come out of that fog and and separate that wheat from the chaff and go okay what was i what was i thinking clearly most of the time no yeah. was was my own sickness informing a lot of my trepidations yeah yeah but you know for a while there sometimes it can seem very real and maybe there are people that cannot separate those things all yeah. the time maybe the maybe their greatest fears become their ultimate motivation yeah, I think you um, could, I think you could probably say that within the polarization that's happening, people flock to the polarization on either side just because those people have the bullhorn and everybody else in the middle is um, you know, if you're trying to toe the line or hold the line for reason and rationality or empiricism or whatever else, um, you, you you know, you you get shouted down because you don't you aren't on the periphery with the bullhorn screaming at all the people in the middle going come over here, you know. So it is very hard to hold the line, so to say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it can be. It's just, it, it's up to your individual constitution this and, is it. You've, and your own integrity. This is it. But so that's the brain breaking part of the podcast. That can be my middle section is sort of, you know, where people message me go, what the fuck, you know? But um, <laughs> yeah, no, it's interesting. I know I just find it fascinating because it's, um, I'm trying to sort of throw the net here and there with different people that I, I feel are going to have interesting responses to this strange position where we find ourselves now, you know? But um, it, is, it is, at the end of the day, uh, trying to sense make is very difficult right now in a, in, in a world that seems to be at the end of a 10 year derangement cycle prompted by the social media, you know, which we never quite had that constantly poking our lizard brain in the same way before. I think that's a new 
phenomena or a new um, stimulus. And, then, and, and using, using the term lizard brain is, is appropriate because that's really what it's appealing to. Yeah. It's appealing to that very base of the, of the brain that is programmed for jealousy, hatred, territoriality. That's exactly what it's, what it's speaking to. And now it's up to the rest of the gray matter that's evolved to have that honest conversation with itself and go, all right, look, you're probably imagining a lot of this. Be on yeah. guard, always yeah. be on guard, but um, don't get too worked up. Yeah, that's that's what I've been. That's that's exactly what I've been trying to do to try and hold the line between that side of my personality that sees those dark things, and the other side of personality that's just like that's just like look, just this is also, as I said, a botched response by a broken system. So you need to fucking hold your tongue and bite your bite your time a little bit. But yet at the same time, you know the truth can lie somewhere in the middle, and they, that even if it lies in the middle or even twenty percent in, it still can have great reper- repercussions for civil liberty or freedom or that kind of thing. Yeah, sure. I mean, and, and a critical appraisal of where we are culturally politically is very difficult to do yeah. as individuals yeah. and and more especially collectively um yeah. and information literacy is another area where the pandemic has really exposed how they're not cracks they're absolute gorges between peoples the, there are so many people that will hear one thing and if it's packaged just right they'll go that's got to be it I mean, yeah. it makes sense to me, but that's the thing about misinformation is it comes into the world fully formed as this neat little package that's easy to swallow and move on with your life. Yeah. Whereas objective truth or empiricism, as you, as you said earlier, that comes a lot slower and yeah. it can be a lot more difficult to connect those dots. And so it requires patience and circumspection. Yeah, exactly. And that's not something that most people excel in. It's not just it's not just that they don't excel in it. It's just that they're not given the time to. Because if you if you if let's say let's say I send you a particular um, a message filled with misinformation and you read it and go oh that seems to agree with my worldview you just forward that on to fifty other people straight away. Like it, it, these things have legs faster than the sense making abilities of the our structures or institutions are able to cope with, or even our own brain is able to cope. That's that's why I picked the lizard brain. That's that what it, I'm talking about. Yeah. yeah, it just keeps. Yeah, coping. that's exactly what I'm talking about. It comes into the world fully formed. It's easier to disperse yeah. and, and it appeals to a wide public. And that's the great tragedy. And that's why objective truth has a much harder time hammering itself into the skulls of people and going, look, you need to take a step back and look at the whole picture of whatever this little, whatever this little thing is we're talking about. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's one of those things, yeah, it, it astounds me as, as an astronomer for 40, 45 years, 46 years, that astrology still exists, that these this belief in, this, in pseudosciences still exists. Sure. And I'm just thinking, it's 2021. If, you know, if astrology worked, we'd fucking know it by now. Sure. You know, whether you want to look at Ptolemy's astrology that comes out of the Tetra Bible, so you want to go back to the, the great ancient mystical texts. It's mm. never proven itself. Why are we still talking about this? You know? yeah, <laughs> and yet that. it's still a wide open field and a lot of major media outlets still have, they, they still have articles about astrology. And I'm like, yeah, I, I guess kidding it, me. Yeah, I guess, well, it just appeals to our sense of um, romance, maybe. You know, the idea well, that- Well, the heart of thinking. Yeah. The heart of thinking. Because ultimately it doesn't take a lot of time to look at, astrology columns between two different media for a given day and see they don't agree at all and they're not even predictions they're just they're just random abstract advice about how you should live yeah there's no connection between them and yet those dots are never connected by the vast majority of people why well i think it's because well there's that great series on netflix that i can't wait to 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 binge tonight you know, or yeah. the, the sports ball is on. Shut up. I'm going to watch that now. And I, it's, oh. there's just too many distractions. Yeah, no, there is there's too many distractions. And people, if people just want a simple um, bite size take on uh, their own, where their own morality should be pointing to or their own emotional state should be pointed to. I, I, I you know, I can understand it in for some people sometimes, i.e. the fact that there's um, the romance of the 
um, journey doesn't mean there's a destination intellectually or something like this. I, I'm not sure how to, de to describe it, but maybe something mm -hmm. like that. That those kind of things, they also give people comfort in a way that maybe the those of us who try and cut straight to the bone of the matter don't feel we need, uh, which maybe leaves other people um, unmoored and heading out into very deep waters that they don't really want to go to. So I find that repeatedly in the last year, um, you hypothesizing about some of the things that may or may not happen, but I find it interesting to think about. But I find them with many people, they push back against it because they will go, this, this, these things are just too dark for me. Like the waters are too deep, so to speak, not to sound patronizing, but I can't live my life if I feel that those things may come true. And so that speak, I think that says a lot in relation to what you just said, maybe, you know, maybe. Yeah, I, I always think about it. <laughs> Well, I, 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 get, I get what you're saying. It, 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 it brings to mind that the last scene in Life of Brian, oh, yeah. where Eric Idle's on the crucifix and he goes, cheer up, Brian, it may never happen. I think it was yeah. in that. Anyway, it said, cheer up, it may never happen. I think it's, it's damn good advice. You know? yeah. yeah, yeah, it is, it is, it is. Um, I'm going to, it's sort of, now I'm, my brain has gone off into a dozen different tangents, but I know that people want to, me to ask you about all this kind of stuff. Um, which is the Bathory stuff, right? Um, mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. it, uh, you were a close friend of, of Corthon, right? Yes. And so, yes. obviously, it's such an enigma that he was. Um, everybody who knew I was, you know, people knew who knew you a bit, who knew I was going to speak to were like, oh, you need to ask him about the Bathory stuff. But how did you get to know him? Or was it just from writing letters originally or what? How did it work? Yeah. Yeah, I, I just I wrote him a letter in 1987. Um, I first time the first time I heard Bathory is uh, 86, mm. and it was on the Speed Kills Two compilation, oh, yeah. which is like my favorite compilation of all time. Yeah. Yeah, anyway, yeah. Um, Under the Sign came out and it just blew my mind. Yeah, you know, I right. love the first two, but Under the Sign came out and blew my mind, and I, I'm like, I got to write this. I got to get to the bottom of this. I was curious, right? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And I don't know what it was about my letters, but it pushed all the right buttons. And we just kept this correspondence all the way through his life. Mm. Um, and, you know, kind of, I had the opportunity to look behind the curtain and, you know, I went to, uh, went to uh, Ejo and stayed with boss yeah. and Claudia in 2006 and my family and I went back in 2008. Um, so I've gotten a look behind the curtain. Now there are people, obviously that were, closer to him in proximity like rex that worked with him from i think it was twilight of the gods on that you know the, the, you know bar buddies guys i mean guys that you could say were actually really close true friends that went out and, and hung out whenever whenever he felt like it anyway uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um but in terms of knowing him personally i don't have any i don't know how well they might have known him. And I ask his dad, I'm like, you know, look, this is Ace and I's history. I, it, it's kind of weird to me. He goes, well, you knew him better than basically everybody else. Mm. And my mind just went at that point. I'm like, I, me? Why me? Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. And I've been working with Chris uh, Maycock on the upcoming Bathory book. Sure, uh, yeah. Helping him connect dots and, and check the timeline on things. Um, and it's astonishing. I mean, it's, it's, it's going to be quite, it's going to be a hell of a book. I'm learning things, you know, and I remember there were things I would ask Ace about. I'm like, remember when you said this? I don't remember that at all. Uh, what, wait, what? I did what? <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah. So, you know, he, he forgot things about his life, just like we always forget things about our own life. Somebody can come up to you and go, hey, remember that time you wore those khaki trousers on whatever, you know, I, I don't remember that. Yeah. But it sticks in someone's mind for whatever reason. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the short answer is yeah. I, you could say I knew him. <laughs> and was this the, was this did this develop from like a letter writing sort of um, '80s thing into uh, you know sort of a, like a sort of I suppose a personal relationship where you met him a few times and all that kind of thing? No, we never actually met. Really, we never got to meet. All right. <laughs> Because it's a really strange, yeah, yeah. you know, he never, he would go out on those, on those little tours. Yeah. He, he would go out on those promo tours, but I mean, when he came to America, it was New York and LA. Yeah. You know, that's basically it. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, I'm stuck in the middle of the country. I'm two days away from New York, two days away from LA. So. Yeah. But I, I suppose that it's, it's interesting to me because it's sort of, 
it's a very underground metal letter writing story, but yet it betrays a, um, and I mean that in a positive way that people say that, it, it betrays a quite old fashioned sense of knowing someone, is it through their letters, can sometimes give you a very great insight into mm -hmm. where they are um, as a person. You know, we all know mm -hmm. famous letter writing um, compendiums between poets who never met. Um, I, I think it can be mm -hmm. a, give you a very good insight into somebody though. Oh, absolutely. You know, one of the people that I have a lot of my life has revolved around is H.G. Wells and yeah. his correspondence volumes are just massive. It's, yeah. it's it, the, 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 the volumes are so big and so expensive. I don't even have them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, the, most of his papers are one state away over in Illinois, uh, at the University of Illinois, but um, hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's absolutely true. And it's one of those things, because I asked his dad, I'm like, you know, I, it's, just, it's just really weird to me that you came to me to help, and you came to me to help you with the box set, which that's its own little story. But yeah. I'm, why me? He's like, because he talked about you, and he talked about your family often. He goes, yeah. I know who you are. I knew who you were years ago. Yeah, yeah. And he valued you above pretty much everybody else. And I'm like, wait, what? Yeah. <laughs> A little it's, old me, but it, then I go back and, and when I was talking about the book earlier with the Chris's writing. It's it, it it sent me back to those old letters that I kept. Yeah. And when I reread those those old letters, I'm like, yeah, I know what his dad meant. I I get it now. I, yeah, we really did know each other. Yeah, it's bizarre because in the last few weeks I've been talking to Chris as well, and I um I lost most of my old cassettes and um, through moving through Dublin, it's different. Um, you know, houses and stuff, but there is about 100 or 200 that are left from the 80s. One of my found has a uh, course on radio interview, um, Portuguese radio 1990, and then one with fans mm -hmm. in the street, which I think is with Fernando from Moonspell. Um, and uh, I, it's sitting in a tape behind me and I'm just waiting to digitize it and then throw it to Chris and kind of go here, you maybe you need got something you need to take from this. But even from all my friends in the Swedish scene, whether they're, um, I suppose, Niflheim, Marduk, Unleashed, Dismember, all of those people, the only, when you say to them, do any of you know him? They're all like, no, no one knew him. The only person I ever met who really sort of knew a bit was Leif Edling from Candlemas. And Leif told me a couple of really, really great, mm -hmm. great stories about him from 82, 83, 84 about going out, like voting out to the mm -hmm. island to watch them rehearse and all that kind of stuff. I guess I've been trying to put Chris on to Leaf. I don't know what where Leaf is right now when it comes to um, correspondence. That was never, I think, his right. his, his main thing. But um, yeah, no one. Right. Very, very well, he would he wouldn't have had to, but yeah, yeah. But very few people seem to really know know him. Right, and yeah, and that was the thing when 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 we talk on the phone, it was you know long distance is expensive, so it's not like you sure, talk yeah. very often. Yeah, yeah. And what we talked about was really basic. It was the letters that we would really dig in and talk about personality things, yeah, things yeah. that we were doing, aspirations, girlfriends, you know, all the personal stuff. Um, that's where all of that really happened. Mm. Um, and you know, I, I ask his dad. You know why? You know, I was asking him why me, and he's like, "Well, I think you were the the one guy that kept a correspondence with him the longest because yeah, nobody, yeah. everybody else has this episodic approach to him. You know, the, the guys that were in the band from March of '83, they were they were out by like the end of '83, basically. Mm. You know, that tumultuous lineup, now, the infamous story of the tumultuous tumultuous lineups. Um, I guess I was the one guy that just kept up with him, and he kept up with me, and. Here we are. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there is some, there is some, like, there's so many enigmas to to even try and dig down into. But like, even just there's a few from my own experience that I thought were um, a little bit curious. I remember because I, I did this Twilight of the Gods band with Runa from who was in Mayhem. Nick Barker played the drums. Uh, Patrick from Tearfing played the guitar, and Froda from Einhörje played the bass. And the idea was that a, in a bar bet. Someone bet me, this is about 12 or 14 years ago, hey, it's almost 20 years up to Hammerheart. Why doesn't Primordial do, you know, because without Hammerheart and Blood for Death, there isn't really any Primordial or probably many other, you know, sort of second generation yeah. black epic bands. So, um, yeah, yeah we, we kind of took that template. But my, ba my mate bet me, uh, oh, why don't you do a Primordial? And I said, I'll tell you what, we'll do a bet. I'll put together a band to play like Under the Runes and Shores and Flames and all this kind of stuff. 
And he went, yeah, right, okay. And so literally next day I started texting the people and we did it, you know, we did like maybe 20, 25 gigs maybe or something like this. And we, but we did the stuff from Twilight of the Gods as well. And I never forget Runa from X May, you know, Mayhem and all this stuff. He's like an amazing guitar player. And we were doing mm-hmm. I think, through Blood by Thunder and he was just, you know, and we played, we're finished rehearsing the song and he just looked at me and he goes, that's not Gorth on playing that guitar on that record. He's just like, how did he go from that to Requiem to Octagon to whatever? And it always stuck in my mind, Runa who was just like, fuck, you know, doing this, some of the stuff. And always, you know, you, maybe you as a guitar player, I don't know, it sounds like sacrilege. Like I, cause it's when I say it, it doesn't sound right to say, but how, you know, seeing as we're just being nerdy about it, but how to go from such a pinnacle of guitar playing at Twilight Gods, it seemed like he just kind of went, ah, a bit after that with Octagon and all those yeah. records. It's just like he didn't give well, a shit. Well, uh, Octagon, o- Octagon, well, no, he did. I mean, and Requiem, he used to tell me, he and I agreed, Requiem is a fantastic album and it was one of his favorite Bathory albums. Um, yeah. I And it's because a lot of things came together for that one. Um, it was... You know, he was really sensitive to what his fan base wanted. He wanted to make them happy above everything else. So whatever communications he was hearing from people, what they liked, what they didn't like, he would take that on board and try to give the fans what they wanted um, within his own particular style and, and you know what he felt like. Um, I remember I asked him about Twilight of the Gods at one point, and he's like, you know, by the end of that, I was so fucking fed up with it all. He goes, I just pushed the levels up and said, forget it. I can't do this anymore. He was exhausted by that album. You know, and of course, then there's other things going on in life that all of us face that he's dealing with, too. And so I I could see him just going, yeah, "Yeah, whatever. I'm glad you like it, Chuck, but you know, it's... That was a really rough time in life. And yeah. <laughs> I was really tired of a lot of things. Well, I mean, it sounds like an exhausting record to make, but the fact that it just it just felt like that to me as um, somebody who loved Bathory. That, and then when we went to rehearse those songs, just that the other guys were like, what's going on here? How did his playing level just seem to go, just seem to dip so dramatically when you come to um, some of those mid to late 90s records and the Nordland stuff? I don't know. It was just a nerdy, well, I thought, I thought, a nerdy guitar question. I, Nordland... Nordland was the, the Nordland albums were basically the the mixing of those styles. Yeah, sure, yeah. You know, because there's a lot of epic stuff on there, and then he returned to some speedy stuff on, like I think, Sign of the Silver Hammer, or whatever. You know, there's some stuff that just you know yeah. bangs out really hard. Um, I don't think that he stepped back from his playing. I think he was just like. Why am I trying so hard? Mm. You know, it's like, I, I, what am I going to do that's bigger and better than Twilight of the Gods? It's like Slayer yeah. after Rain and Blood. They're like, they look around like, we can't, this is the pinnacle for us. We're just going to go do something else. Yeah. You know, you could have the same conversation about Slayer. Like, well, why is South of Heaven so weak? Okay. You know, why is Seasons in the Abyss, in the Abyss even weaker? Well, yeah, I mean, they've I, already done everything they can do. I would have the, you know? I would have the Seasons in the Abyss comment, but I, I, I really do love, I love South of Heaven. It's a dark, brooding sort of record that went off in an, an angle off Rain of Blood. But I, but I do take the point. But it just seemed strange to yeah. me that Twilight of the Gods has this massive production values. And then it just kind of you went, all right, we're going to go back to, well, not, but not 1983, to some other place. But did you get the impression? This is one of the things I, I got when I sat down with Leaf from Calumas. We, we, we sat at Roadburn for a long, long time and talked about all these old stories. And Leaf kind of got, gave me the impression that for the, you know, the last 10 or 15 years of his life in that, He'd been the rock star in the 80s and the early 90s, but that because he never stepped out onto the stage to play live, the the mechanism that would have kept him going, so to speak, on those terms had ceased to be because scenes had moved on and people had moved on. And Leaf kind of sort of intimated to me that he got the impression he was a bit of a sort of lonely dude at the end, the end the last few years. Maybe that's a sort of personal question. I don't know. But I suppose when you relate... It's, it's pretty personal, but I... I, I, I mm-hmm. I, I don't think it's too far, too too wide of the mark. I, th- yeah. I think he he liked his privacy. You know, the whole family is a very private. It's a yeah. private family, and mm-hmm. he was just he's just one of those guys. He didn't mind being on his own, own and you know together um, about that. But yeah, I I think it's I think it's it's a pretty astute observation, frankly. Well, I, I have a very good, uh, well, um, I haven't seen her in a few years, but a, a good friend of mine, um, Jeanette, German uh, girl, she used to do this band called Bather Lord and a whole bunch of other stuff. I haven't seen her for a few years. 
um, he had like 120 Bathory shirts and she met him two or three times actually in Sweden in the 2000s. And she sort of said to me at the same time, it, he struck her, uh, um, if I'm sorry, Jeanette, if you're watching and I'm wrongly paraphrasing you, but the, it seemed like the moment had passed to step out onto the stage to finally do it, even though I heard there was money offered by Vakken and all this kind of stuff. And then we heard the crazy story, oh, Edge of Sanity are going to be his backing band. And it just seemed to me that somehow taking that leap of faith might have given um, the last couple of years of being in the band a, a sort of new sense of purpose or meaning that I, I, which I don't understand why he didn't take that jump. Was it the guitar playing, the voice? What do you, I mean, you do you have an int, an intimation as to why? I, it would be? I don't think that. I, just, I don't. I think it was he was so just demoralized by the inability to hold the lineup together that it just didn't seem worth it. He could he could still do his studio projects and just live his life. Uh, without having to get involved in all the 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 band bullshit, but let's that, say, but let's say, let's have to deal with. But let's say it was too. Now, uh, I I uh, also had I also had the the same dream that you did hmm. about you know the, if is Kurt going to ask you to sing? I was always like, is Ace ever going to call me to be his his rhythm guitarist? Because oh, wow, I'll do yeah. that in the I'll do that in a second, man. Yeah. <laughs> Just sign me up. Yeah, you yeah. Know. But it, but it's it's because it kind of struck me that well, what we heard was like because um when Primordial started to play a couple of the bigger festivals here and there in 2098, 2001, 2002, but we took little steps up, incremental steps up, but I be you began to hear gossip when you would poke, you know, drunk booking agents at Vakken or whatever. They were sitting around there going, oh yes, we offered, we offered Bathory X amount of money to play, but in the end we got Nocturno Culto with Sectiricon singing Dark Throne instead. And you're like, all right, okay, 2004, whatever it was. And then somebody else tells you, yeah, yeah, they wanted Edge of Sanity, or like I said, Edge of Sanity, or whoever it was to be the backing band. But yet at the 11th hour, he kind of went, no, I don't want to do it. Or um, did, like, did you have a sense of why? I mean, I don't know. I'm, I like, I make up the answers in my head. They've been going around in my head for years. Was it, do you think there was an element of like maybe fear at getting it wrong for all the people who love the band so many years to stand up on the no. stage? No, no, I, I, I don't think that was it at all. Um, I, I just, I, I don't think that it was the right time. I just don't think that I don't think his heart was into it at, at that point because if he wanted it to happen, he could have made it happen. Yeah, um, that's what I think. And what... I, I think the pretense, the pretense would have been, well, we can't have the big Man of War Kiss kind of uh, from uh, production with the bombs and all that. But I, I, I honestly think a lot of that was pretense. Yeah, because that's what I, I heard. The story I heard was that back in had offered that slot like the, the huge stage and like, we'll put the stuff up, we'll put the huge mm -hmm. thing, uh, we'll do, that will be part mm -hmm. of the thing. That now, of course, you know, Holger from Vakken probably has the, he knows, mm -hmm. of course, more than me. I'm just a, some fucking peripheral, uh, you know, lad trying to listen to some gossip of, yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, of, of my childhood hero that maybe would step out on the stage. But it just seemed like maybe the moment had passed but I, but I, somehow I find it, would I find it hard to deal with the fact that it could just be logistics, because that would, you know what I mean? Well, because you and I are fans, and we really yeah. wanted it to happen. You know, yeah. we really wanted to see that happen. Um, but, but I, want, I from... wanted it to happen to be. I wanted it to happen like amazingly well. It would break my heart if it was bad. So I was kind of on a knife edge about it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry to interrupt mm -hmm. you, but you know. Yeah, and. I mean, I, I wanted I wanted it to happen too, but um, I only wanted it to happen if if he wanted it to happen. Yeah. And I just yeah, those last years. I mean, a lot of. I don't know how to, I don't know how to, pull all this together succinctly. But I just there's a lot there was a lot going on in his life that I think that uh, might have just been too distracting. Uh, um, and ultimately he was thinking, if he was thinking about the band at all, yeah, yeah. he was thinking about what he was going to do on the next record. Um, yeah, yeah. and you know, the, the idea of suddenly having to face everything that we and in, in active bands do, we, we in bands that go out and play, mm. that was just like, Oh God, you know, and the weird thing is, is his dad, that's what he did since the sixties, you know? Yeah. Burya knew, I mean, he was involved, deeply involved in the, in the music business. So dad could have pulled all this together. Yeah. yeah. But I just, it, it could have been 
just it, such a hassle, yeah, such yeah. a hassle. And even though you've got all these people offering to do all this for you, how do you know they're going to do it the way you want it done? And yeah. I just, I don't know. I, I think it, 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 if it were, and I'm looking at it through my lens, I could see him just going, you know what? Nah, forget it. I, I yeah. Especially maybe. You know, but, there, but there may be more to the story than that too. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Especially if you haven't taken the early baby steps. Um, like as in you hadn't played a couple of club gigs and you hadn't played a couple of gigs where you'd had to cope with, oh, the fucking amp head doesn't work and the pedal, you know, like mm -hmm. the, the, the things we all do as teenagers. Right. Uh, like, cause Leaf told me a story about them rowing out to the island, you know, where they rehearse or going to watch them, to watch battery rehearse with all the gear and all the backdrops and all that kind of stuff in 82 or 83, but I guess 83. And that they would bring a few beers and sit and it was as near to and a gig as it ever got. But at the same time, it wasn't a gig. Mm -hmm. So of course that was, I guess, Nemesis, mm -hmm. was the pre Candlemas thing. So they were trying to play in youth halls. Leaf was up there trying to sing by his own admission. He was like, oh, I don't think, not really into this and but making mistakes to learn from whereas when you think about battery you think mm -hmm. he never learned those yeah. stage mistakes to learn from so imagine they happen in front of forty thousand people at vacan uh maybe yeah. that pressure yeah. is great you know what i mean that could have been it, it, it very well could have been that's as good an explanation as any frankly yeah, well it's been going around in my head for <laughs> decades yeah. and decades you know you know, because he would hear stories from, you know, people like me and, and, you know, he had to have written to some other guys in bands that were telling him stories too. Yeah. He had to hear these stories. Yeah. Where he's like, oh my God, you know, OF, there's a, in my, I have a, I had a Marshall MOSFET, one of those um, field effect transformers. It starts playing a baseball game. And so in between OFC songs, it's yeah. the Kansas City Royals versus the St. Louis Cardinals. And you're like, I mean, it was a total spinal tap moment, yeah, yeah. you know, and for, for me, you know, for OFC, you're like, oh, this is great. This is funny. This yeah. is funny as hell. This is what a great story, you know, <laughs> but, but for him, you, I could see it be daunting. But when you think about it, let's say mid 2000s, I'm sure somebody could have quite easily said to all of Emperor, by the way, can you learn all of these songs and perfectly execute them and stand at the back? It's Emperor. Of course, it's probably going to be flawless execution if it's Ishan and stuff. And they probably could have gone, learn all of it you know court on you just step in play rehearse once or twice you don't need to know these guys play i mean for sure by the time the 2000s you know late 2000s come along there were so many great musicians that you know when you talk about the people you rehearsed with in the 80s um and you then you compare them to some of the people he could have potentially had like step up and play with him you know you could just have stepped on stage with a satiricon or an emperor um, but maybe I, in my head, he's so far removed from that scene and those people to not know. Absolutely. How, yeah, that was maybe absolutely. Awesome. I mean, he, he was, he, he never, it, it never impressed. He never impressed me as being all that comfortable with what the Norwegians did yeah. to his legacy. I, he said they took one album and they drove it into the fucking ground. Mm. And that was an album that his feelings on under the sign are like my feelings on stillbirth machine. It's like, why do you like that album so much? Listen to it. It sounds awful. You know, and I made similar mistakes on Stillbirth Machine that he made on Under One Sign. Maybe that's one of the things that united us in the very beginning. I don't know. Yeah. So, we, you know, he experimented with the Rockman guitar box and I did too. Sure. Um, and, but, you know, it's like they took that one aspect of the Bathory sound and like, that's Bathory. And he's like, no, no, it's not. You know, and so there was a lot of that. And, and then there was all the, you know, the political controversy and, and the, the church burnings and the murders and all that. And he's just like, I, that's not me. Yeah, yeah. Come on. <laughs> I mean, Why I do mean, I get tagged with this? Yeah, I mean, I just picked their name kind of out of the hat. It could have been, I mean, look, he could have used any band in the world probably to be his back. Well, but I mean, ultimately we're talking about, you know, Bathory, everybody thinks, you say Bathory, most people think black metal. And so what has black metal become since 1991? This Norwegian thing. Sure. So, of course, you of know, course. from his perspective, I remember one time he sent me, <laughs> it, was, it had to be 92, one of the very first covers albums that somebody did and they sent it to him and it was like, it was a bunch of Greek bands that had covered Bathory. <laughs> and he sends me this tape, he goes, listen to this and tell me honestly, was Bathory really this bad? <laughs> <laughs> No, you weren't that bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, so his the, the the feedback, I guess what I'm trying to say is the feedback that he was getting from fans, I can see him kind of going, I've been completely misinterpreted here. Mm. 
And but, but in a way, maybe, I mean, there were so many bands who came after, you know, influenced by Hammer and Twilight of the Gods that were maybe bubbling under the surface. And I would count Primordial amongst those bands who took the epic um, template and, and sort of, and the whole early pagan metal scene that maybe he might have maybe been more, maybe be more comfortable with the Enslaves or the, I don't know, Gunagura Bunjits or um, many, many bands of that ilk who were not the church burning, um, you know, mm -hmm. Uh, the, it was far less controversial, maybe, but in my head, well, I'm like, in my yeah. head, I'm thinking to myself, he's just listening to Kiss. He's not paying any attention to any of this stuff, you know. He's yeah. listening to Kiss. He's listening to Motorhead. He's listening to Sex Pistols. He's listening to Toya Wilcox and Kate Bush, and yeah. a lot of classical music. Yeah, yeah. He and I were exactly alike, like that. Yeah. <laughs> well, except I never liked Kiss. I can't say I like Kiss. Uh, I never liked Kiss. Yeah, the Irish people are just a bit like, a bit. You know, Kiss reformed for their Psycho Circus tour. And in Dublin, um, they were in this, like, I guess, booked into this 12,000 seat arena and sold less than a thousand tickets in 1993 or four. Irish people just went, Ugh, look, we like ACDC. We don't like this. Of course, it changed a little bit when Kiss mm -hmm. came around 30 years later for their farewell 25 years later. But mm -hmm. yeah, I died. The Kiss thing, I, I get it, but I also don't get it. I prefer ACDC. Well, that. he was super excited. We were talking on the phone back in 96, and it was when Kiss had just pulled Ace Freely back in the band. They put on the makeup again. Oh, yeah. They made that big world tour as the and original like Kiss. Circus, and yeah. he was kind of excited. Oh, was that what it was? He was kind yeah. of excited about that. You know, he's yeah. like, I'm going to go see that. It's going to be cool. You know, but he goes, I'm not expecting a return to 1977. No. He goes, but it's going to be cool. Yeah, yeah. You know. But when you think about it, 90, 1996 is not that far from 1977. But we were just talking about mm -hmm. the beginning. We're further, we're right. much more, we're a decade and more away from Stillbirth Machine sitting here yeah. talking now. That, 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 well, that, we started recording Stillbirth Machine 30 years ago this summer. So, that, yeah, I mean, we're, we're yeah. 30 years on. That, that material is basically written by now. Yeah, that fucks with my head because, um, you know, that thing when somebody says, oh, like, I, you remember when you bought into the pandemonium? And or say yeah. uh, it was four years past Kill 'em All, but Kill 'em All felt ancient in a yeah, way. Yeah, absolutely. And now, yeah. and now look where we are. <laughs> we're thirty years on from Stillbirth Machine having this conversation about, for whatever for whatever reason, this the first time we've had this conversation. That sort of it doesn't impact me. It, well, it impacts me uh, very strangely because it doesn't feel like that long ago. But yet, eighty three to eighty seven, I guess, feels like a long time when you're. And out of that yeah or something like that because you, know? you don't have a frame of reference yet you're still a kid you haven't lived all that long but you know you can play that numbers game 30 years on from 1991 30 years before that there's no beatles it's yeah. still chuck berry you know duck walking yeah. across the stage you yeah. know it's 1961 yeah. so yeah these are the spans of time we're talking about what's amazing to me is the fact that metal is still basically identifiable i mm. mean that it's that you look at the difference between rock and roll in 1961 and 1991. There's a lot, we have a lot more in common today with 1991 than 1991 did with 1961, in my view anyway, but I'm a metal guy. So that's my frame of reference for it. I need to think about that, but I know I understand what you mean because it, it, it just the, I guess it's just the longevity thing is that Kill 'Em All is only 14 years after the first Black Sabbath album, but here we are talking about something that's 30 years ago. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, it's yeah. just, it's, it's, it's a strange thing. I had this conversation, I was talking to Jason uh, or from Misery Index just about that death metal purple patch in 1991 or so. And yeah, again, it's also 30 years ago, but yet to, you know, 2005 feels mm -hmm. like about six months ago to me, but. I suppose that's, mm -hmm. that's yeah. 1986 feels six months ago to me. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's, I suppose that's the damned privilege of you know getting older. I suppose you know. Yeah, yeah. And it's a privilege denied to some. <laughs> exactly. I think on that moment, this will be a good moment to press stop. And so.